Our presentation today is about food safety in Africa. I'm Jules. I'm Anir. I'm Nikesh. I'm Nikita. One in ten Shh. people in Africa contract foodborne illnesses each year. This amounts to 91 million people as of 2015. Some reasons for food safety issues include agriculture, meat industry, water pollution, and food preservation. So to talk about food safety in Africa, we first have to discuss Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the most rapidly growing areas in the African subcontinent. And even though it's growing, it's experiencing, it's very behind in many aspects, and this is best seen by the food industry. So with a growing population, that increases the demand for food. And farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa experience terrible working conditions which leads to lots of contaminated produce being exported to people in the, in the region. And this is the root cause of the problem. So one of the first steps that's contaminated is the resources that farmers use. So as you can see in this picture, this man is taking water from an extremely polluted river. Contaminated water is then used for the irrigation of soil, as you can see in this picture over here. And this contamination can also be spread through improperly composted manure or feces by domestic animals. The contamination spreads to the produce that rises from the soil and which is then sold to the people of Sub-Saharan Africa. And when the people eat these food, um, it spreads foodborne illnesses. So some examples of foodborne illnesses include E. coli, cholera, salmonella, campylobacteriosis, uh, food poisoning, toxoplasmosis, and norovirus. So transitioning from small-scale farmers, as I just mentioned, to animal products uh, such as meat, the meat industry in Africa is actually one of the growing, the leading causes of food safety concerns. And this is all down to an overall lack of regulation throughout the entirety of the food industry. And this can be seen in a variety of, uh, of situations, such as the pictures here. These are both taken from a uh, meat market in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, as you can see in the left, a bunch of chickens are just put into a one area with uh, no uh, proper packaging, ventilation to keep them fresh. And here on the right, in this in this section of the meat market, uh, meat is just on display without, again, proper ventilation, and it's just left uh, to rot in the hot human air. Uh, and again, you can see people are just allowed to touch. There's no barrier to prevent uh, the uh, passage of uh, pathogens. And uh, However, this can be seen throughout the entirety of the meat industry supply chain, from farm where uh, livestock is raised, to the slaughterhouse where meat is harvested, and to the market where meat is actually sold. So in the farm, this is from taken from a farm in South Africa, where pigs are kept in a damp, dirty condition, and they're not given much room to wander. And, uh, and then in the slaughterhouse, uh, you can see pig carcasses that are lined up, but there's no ventilation, and there's not proper packaging to keep them fresh. And in the market, you can see once again that people are allowed to come up to the meat, touch them. There's no ventilation, no protection, nothing to prevent the spread of pathogens, pathogens as Ani really mentioned. So transitioning from the meat industry to the water industry, in 2020, the number of African deaths due to unsafe water was 485,000. Unsafe water causing diseases like cholera, typhoid, and hepatitis A is a bigger cause of human death annually than disaster and conflicts combined. There are a number of contributors to water scarcity ranging from the dumping of industrial waste to rising temperatures due to global warming. These are some main causes of water pollution in Africa, harmful pesticide usage in agriculture, waste dumping and mining, lack of water purity technology, increased def deforestation, rapid urbanization, and an overall lack of financial resources. These reasons all impact the wildlife, water cycle, and e ecosystems of African nations. All three of these factors are part of the larger food um, distribution chain. And in this within this chain for, at all levels there can be failure points which allow food make food preservation which makes food unsafe. At the production level this can include unsafe ingredients, improper refrigeration, and unsanitary equipment. While all the way at the other end of the consumer level it can include inefficient cooking, unclean prep an unclean prep environment, or ineffective storage. One of the most vital parts of keeping perishable foods safe to eat is a cold chain, which is the process, which is the infrastructure that keeps food cold um, on its way from production out of the farm to all the way through consumers, including transportation to processing, uh, markets, and in, in home places. And each break in the chain causes an exponential increase in bacteria, 
or at the rate of spoilage, meaning food lasts for a lot less time or will be much less likely to be safe to eat when people get it. And a lot of regions in Africa lack the proper infrastructure to have an effective food chain, cold chain. Um, so this brings us to our central question, which is how can food insecurity be minimized in the African subcontinent? So the first solution we came up with is a consumer education program. So leaders in, uh, uh, of these uh, sub and sub uh, the nations of the sub-African uh, continent uh, can call in medical experts and scientific researchers from around the world that are verified and proven to uh, be expert, experts in the area and they can come in and help educate the public through national broadcast stations and uh, radio networks uh, and they can advertise simple things that the public may not know such as washing produce uh, uh, and just overall spotty malpractice uh, within the industry and to uh, attack the solution from the private sector uh, uh, a proportion of these uh, experts can come, that come in can be uh, used by the national leaders of these governments to uh, go into private sectors, uh, large-scale farms to help them also reform their, uh, their plantations. This brings us to our benefits and limitations. Our benefits include proper education, disaster avoidance, and consumer protection. This will allow people to understand how behavior and activities contribute to the safety of food. It will also protect consumers of food products from foodborne diseases and protect consumers from injuries related to food consumption. Despite the immense benefits that Nikita just listed, there is one big limitation inhibiting the solution from being effective. As you can see on this map of Africa here on the right, the area of the map that is green represents uh, countries in Africa with a GDP of less than $6 billion. For reference, the United States of America's GDP is a whopping $23 trillion. So while this solution may be, may be effective in theory, the lack of infrastructure, uh, economy, uh, funding, and overall industry and the African subcontinent render this solution as ineffective. So the second solution that we plan to implement was using external aid and intervention through the United Nations. So we plan to use organizations such as the United Nations WHO or the World Health Organization, the FAO Food Agriculture Organization, or UNIDO, which is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Global organizations such as these ones can support the implementation of large-scale plants, which are more designed for an entire subcontinent instead of just one singular country. They can also increase the effectiveness of infrastructural implementation, and external support and funding can help make up for the lacking GDP of these developing nations. The governments of these smaller countries are encouraged to utilize tools and advice provided by these organizations in the development of food legislation as well as other aspects of national food control systems. So some benefits of the solution would be that the United Nations is a trusted international organization. It's been in place since the middle of the 20th century and it's done a lot of charitable work. Um, another pro would be that it has sufficient funds as seen by United Nations organizations such as the World Bank and the UN Fifth Committee and it has had effective implementations in the past with solutions in developing nations. But one big limitation of this solution is that in previous actions taken by United Nations organizations, they have led to rising prices in these developing nations, which causes many people to move away from rural areas in these developing nations and move towards cities in Zika in, in the hope of getting a better job, which causes rural farmers to have less people to export their produce to. Ultimately, we decided that the second solution, using international aid and intervention, would be the best solution for this problem. Um, this solution would overcome underlying economic problems that were barriers to food safety because it would include external funding. Uh, it would have large, it would have large scale effects with, on things like supply chains, and it introduces long term infrastructure, so it won't be a short term solution that stops when this out, when outside benefits are gone. It would allow. Um, continuous production and safety for food. And that's our presentation. Woo! We're going to ask each of you folks a question. Uh, Jules, give one specific way that your thinking changed as a result of uh, as a result of learning about Nikita's findings. Uh, so Nikita focused on the water supply and water safety and that was a big influence on me because my my focus had primarily been on um, 
foodborne illness and diseases that can come from unsafe food. Um, her findings also included a lot of information about pollution, such as from mining. And so I had, beforehand, I hadn't viewed pollution as a significant problem. Um, I hadn't really seen the scope of it, and her findings uh, brought it to my view. Okay. Uh, Nikita, what do you feel was Jules's greatest contribution to the group's final argument? So Jules' um, report was about food preservation in Africa and how they have tried many ways and it, and it has failed. So when we came up with our solution, we wanted to have international aid that um, had long-term solutions to also to find a way to preserve this food for Africa. Okay. Anirudh, um, describe an argument from one of your peers' individual reports that makes you think differently about your team's solution or conclusion. So one argument that was in Lukash's paper, which focused on large-scale um, farmers, is that was one thing that changed my opinion on some of these solutions because I personally focused on small-scale farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, whereas Lukash focused on more large-scale industries. And so I thought that maybe um, some of the solutions that we plan to implement, I looked into the effects on how small-scale farmers would be affected by these solutions as well as large-scale farmers. So I would say that Lukash's, um, uh, he, his research on large-scale farmers implement, or it changed the way that I looked at some of these solutions. Okay. And then Lukash, uh, what is an example of a compelling argument from one of your peers' individual reports that you decided to exclude from your team's presentation and why? So one thing we decided to exclude was Jules in her paper mentioned that how the breakdown of cold chains uh, leads to overall malnutrition in Africa. However, the, when we were discussing our topic, we decided that malnutrition and food safety were two different issues and that we want to focus on food safety. So we decided to exclude malnutrition and focus on the overall topic of food safety in Africa. Okay, thank you very much.